Our present, our, our guest speaker this evening is Christina Neubauer, and the bicycle has been important to her life for many reasons as a means of transport. She's worked at West Cycle Department of Transport and she's also been part of the City of Stirling's volunteer program called Wheelie Wonderful Women. It's not easy to say. Um, Christina has provided their bicycle education program as <coughs> accredited Oz Cycle Skills Coach in 2013. Christina uh, launched her blog People on Bicycles in 2014 and with the goal to connect people who love riding bicycles but ne don't necessarily see themselves as cyclists. Uh, the blog has grown into a mission driven enterprise and three years on Christina is running bicycle workshops in schools, communities and also in workplaces. So would you please welcome Christina Neubauer. It's actually really nice to hear the the sound. I was practicing. <laughs> well done. Well, thank you for having me. Um, what I wanted to talk about is, I guess, give you a my perspective on what this movie would look like if it was kind of encapsulating the Perth culture running. And one of the reasons why I found the title of the movie quite unpalatable bikes versus cars is the culture in Perth is very sport driven. So there's a lot of people who ride for sport on bikes in groups and they always use the car to get to the start and then ride their bike <laughs> and I see someone going, yeah I do that all. <laughs> but that's okay, you're still riding your bike. There's also a, a really strong community of people who ride for transport and they will do this no matter what, whether it's sunshine, 30 degrees, or rain. You do that too, good. <laughs> Go on, start. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start by asking, what do, how do people feel? Do you feel there's a conflict between cars and bikes? I mean, that in the end, they're inanimate objects. It's just people using different means. You were nodding. Oh yeah, no, I've been riding sometimes and had people try to catch up with mm. this, and you've got to slam your brakes and you're on a bike. And you're in the right spot, so yeah, so you had a bit of antagonistic encounters. Um, yeah, I agree, but it goes both ways. Yeah. yeah, there's animosity from the bikes towards the cars as well, <coughs> and I understand for a reason as well. But it's definitely, yeah, I have also experienced you know, not very good behavior from, from cars, very aggressive behavior, but I also have experienced aggressive behavior from other cyclists. Mm. And that distinction you make, um, I think, is part of that difference. Mm. When, I mean, I'm an experienced cyclist, and if I see a peloton coming down the corner of the freeway, 24 over on the white line, it's pretty scary. Mm. 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 And I've yelled at them, and they just <laughs> love it. So what I keep saying is, it doesn't matter whether people are angry people, mm. they will be angry in cars, mm. and they will be angry on bikes. It doesn't, the mode of transport doesn't really change the attitude, really. So, um, with my, the training that I provide, I, I do encounter a lot of people who have some contemplation of riding. So I've done expos in the past, for example, where people come to me and go, oh, what, so what do you, how do you, what do you suggest? And I go, well, you could ride your bike. You could, you know, ride to work or, you know, ride to the shops. And there is at least five reasons they will throw at me why they can't do it. No, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too rainy, and I'm thinking, we are yeah. in Perth, <laughs> <laughs> people in Denmark. Um, I can't ride my bike because it's not safe, there's no, no lanes to get me to work, I don't have a shower at work, or the one big is, well, my work provides me with a car, so I have to drive it home and I have to drive it to work because it has to be available. So I don't want to discount any of the reasons, um, they, they are valid for that particular person uh, and fear is one of the, the elements that you can really, I, th I guess this comes back to why I don't like bike versus cars because there's this element of fear, mm -hmm. this element of war, um, which was nicely wrapped up at the end of the movie where the uh, activist in Sao Paulo was saying well actually this is a city, this is just a you know, place where we want to live and it doesn't have to, it shouldn't be a war. So, there's all these things that people say, oh, I can't do, uh, you know, ultimately they don't do it. And then on the other hand, I look at 
daily life and I see people going, or never going, I love commuting by car. It's the best part of my day. I really want to sit in my vehicle and just enjoy because there's never any traffic, there's never any congestion. Um, so I can drive my, my car to work straight away and I'll you know, never wait at any traffic light or any congestion at all. And parking, parking is so easy. I love finding parking. <laughs> no one ever says this. Um, so, yes, there's these um, perceptions we have of cars being a status symbol and you kind of assume that this is part of your life. But the reality is that driving is not particularly awesome. It's not a great experience. People don't really enjoy it. People never say, oh, you know, I, I feel so fit driving to work every day. It makes me feel really um, you know, inspired and refreshed. Yeah. I think that, like, with cars, as you were saying before, like, I feel so alive driving in my car. Ooh. It's a piece of crap I bought second hand that uh, has lots of damage. Although, like, if it's a bike, it's like, oh, I had lots of fun. Like, I got to meet new people. I had fun. I mean, it's kind of like that. Although with cars, it's just like, like, beep. Yeah, you're disconnected get from your mind. Like, I guess um, with cycling, you get to socialize more. That's very true. Yeah. Do other people experience that? Mm -hmm. Those yep. who run. Because all of a sudden, you can talk to people. In a car, you do meep for hello, or meep, get out of the way. Mm, you're too slow, mm, you're too fast. <coughs> What does that mean? On a bike, you can talk. Yeah. I was, was going to say, you talked about the fears before of people cycling. I, I grew up cycling, so I don't have a fear. So I'm thinking if children are taught to cycle from a very young age, like the little the man was showing his little son on the trike. What toy? Yeah, to, to cycle at that age. Um, I'm, fi I'm thinking that if they can get the confidence at that age, they can go into adulthood with the confidence still, rather than not cycle as a child and try and get over that fear as an adult, which is a lot harder. I think one, one aspect in the movie was um, really good and that is children don't actually have any fear. It's adults putting the fear in children. And one of the main reasons, so people say you can have a good measure of how cycling friendly a place is by the amount of women who ride. And that is one aspect that's um, not great in Perth. It's a very, very male dominated sport a very male dominated uh, activity in commuting. So as a woman you don't you don't commute by bike. And I've always wondered why most of the, the women that I teach in, in the bicycle classes the women and I wonder why that is, why do they lack that confidence? And why do they not make it a priority to actually enjoy their commute and do something good for themselves and for the environment. And part of that is one aspect that was mentioned in the Toronto example well, it's just not feasible to put a family on a bus. And a dog. With a dog. And a, do With a dog. Yeah. The dog comes to work. I don't know. I don't understand. But that, no. Um, so it, it is in Perth an interesting phenomenon that women still do the drop off of children to school. It's the majority. I'm not saying everybody does that, but the majority of women that's their job. They have a part time job. It's not as important as the man's job, doesn't earn as much money, so they're lumped with this task of... But it wasn't always like that. When I grew up in the 70s, we all got to school by ourselves. Yeah. No oh, one no one that lived us, unless they lived a million miles away. So we all walked to school, we rode a bike, we caught a bus. I think one thing you just said is really important, unless they lived a million yeah. miles away. And one aspect that people don't remember is distance. Yeah. So I had another example, I had someone at an expo say to me, well, I, uh, I work in the city and I, I can't commute because I live at least 20 kilometres away. I'm just not that fit. I'm going, okay, fine. So where do you live? Well, I live in Swanbourne. Yeah, right. I'm going, Swanbourne? That's not 20 kilometres. <laughs> that's, that's maybe 15 maximum, I think more 12. Mm -hmm. You can do that. You don't actually have to be fit to do that. That's an hour's worth of exercise. <coughs> do you exercise an hour a day? Oh, well, I go to the gym an hour. Well, <laughs> you drive into work, and then you drive to the gym, you exercise for an hour, and then you go home. Whereas you could do that in one swinging motion. So the other aspect you said is people don't, they only drive when they live really far. 
to and school. people don't to school. Yeah. Mm. People live further away from school. But I was thinking when I was in Amsterdam and in Copenhagen, there were specific train carriages designated for cycles, mm. and in yeah. Perth, you're not allowed to supposedly take your cycle yeah. on the mm -hmm. public yeah. transport yeah. you pick yeah. out, mm. and it's total opposite in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, yeah. and um, Copenhagen because. They, they have the whole carriage designated for the cycle, so you get on the, put your bike on the cycle, Absolutely. and then you go to your work and then come home and ride. So it's, it's just... Yeah. Yeah, I also think going back to that ch the children's, um, the, re the relationship of children and cycling is that in places like the Netherlands, they actually run classes in school for the children to learn how to not only ride the bike and yeah. bike skills, but actually negotiate their local streets and yep. the parents participate and they have a one day a year where the children have to then negotiate a part, you know, a, tr a route that's set out by the parents and the school and, the, and everybody turns out for it and the kids have to do their ride through and, and show that they can cross, not just ride in local streets but actually cross busy roads, um, use their bicycle properly, do the hand signals and the whole bit and so that's, it's starting at the school levels, yep. I think crucial to it. Forget the sport cycle. So that's a, it's like saying, um, I don't know, I do you know, mountain climbing or something. It's a sport. Um, mm. But cycling for transport, is it has to start with children yep. and the parents as well. Not just the children. And that's can I add to that? Right. So what we have at the moment mm. is sporting cyclists, they're male. Mm. And they do sometimes commute because that's mm. part of their exercise yeah. and their routine, right? Getting on right. Strava, making sure they're yeah. doing their kilometres and they're fast. Yeah. And what they could do, hypothetically, is negotiate the drop-off and say, well, I'll drop the child off by the bike and I'll keep riding. Absolutely. And mum goes on her bike and do does whatever she wants to do. Absolutely, it's quite, I mean, yeah, it's, it's doable. Can I just say that um, both my boys used to ride their bikes to school I'll say bikes because they were all stolen on regular basis and I bought bike after bike after bike. They got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. <laughs> uh, but that is a major problem because you know, even with the bigger bike locks. So were they stolen from school or from your home? Both. Okay. <laughs> Train stations. Okay. They got found in the Swan River. Uh, yeah, it was. Thanks for coming. I would See recommend buying second hand bikes, particularly kids, because they do grow and you upgrade them. Well, now they're big enough, they buy their own bikes. Yeah. Um, but, um, Probably also helps with the routine of actually locking it when you have bought it yourself. No, they cut through new locks. Okay. Um, yeah, I ended up with locks that were almost more expensive than the bikes. Right. But it was a real challenge. I, I think I went through about six bikes with my two boys. Wow. With them being stolen. That must have been a bad neighbourhood. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's <laughs> Net Well, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so, one thing that I wanted to leave you with, in, I think 2006, um, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth came out. Do you remember that movie? Mm -hmm. Well, I watched that and everyone in my work watched it and we all talked about how awesome it is and we have to do something about it. And then a month later in the um, in the lunchroom someone said, so, you know, it's been four weeks. Did you actually do anything? Did you actually change anything in your life? Anything that inspired you, yeah. was inspired by the movie? And everybody just looked at each other and went, oh, not really. Yeah. Yeah, I think it changed a light bulb to something more energy efficient, but not, not really. So. After watching this movie, have a think, what is it that you can do that you really want to make? And it doesn't mean you have to go on a bike and ride. It could be just thinking about you know, a, a, a bike on the road. So next time you, you know, leave a car park or get on the road and there is someone on a bicycle, have a think what sort of you know, signals you give that person. Anything. So have a think. What it, did, did this movie actually create anything in, in you, inside of you that makes you go, yeah, let's have a, let's do something about this. Thanks, Christina.